Good evening, I'm Vashi Capellos. Ian is away. New cases of the UK coronavirus variant are detected in Canada. There are probably other people that have this variant. The accelerated effort to track it and brace for its impact. A standoff over the US COVID relief bill ends. What finally pushed the president to sign? Our reporters look back on the pandemic's early days. The risk to Canadians remains low. I remember that day, and I think what was stunning about it is how quickly that changed. Alone in this tent, this woman has raised tens of thousands of dollars for charity. Impossible is just an opinion until you try. This is The National. Health officials across Canada are on alert tonight as the new UK variant of the coronavirus shows up in different parts of the country. Today we learned of a patient in BC's island health region who returned from the UK on December 15th and developed symptoms while in quarantine. A test confirmed it was the new variant four days later and a small number of close contacts have been isolated as a result. The other new case was found in Ottawa. Another traveler from the UK, this one landed here on the 19th. That makes four known cases of a strain believed to be more easily transmitted than the one that first spread around the world. Talia Ricci shows us how that's ramping up concern, especially in places that are already hard hit. Experts had warned there were likely more cases of the COVID-19 UK variant in Canada. We now know the first couple who tested positive had a connection to a UK traveller. I think many had expected it and, and noting that the UK had been describing this variant since September. And today, more cases emerged, even beyond Ontario. The Public Health Agency of Canada says the new variant may be significantly more contagious, as early data suggest, but so far there's no evidence it causes more severe illness. It's terrifying news to find out that there's a new strain here when we can't even control the original one. Jessica Wong's grandmother is in an Ontario nursing home overrun by COVID-19. Currently, 128 residents have active cases and 41 people have died at Tender Care Living Centre. Wong's family had been working to get her out. We got the call in the morning that she was in fact tested positive. So we were not able to take her out. We were just too late on that. While the vaccine rollout continues, Wong is desperate for updates on her grandmother's health from overwhelmed staff. If you try calling the, the floor with the nurse, that extension, it's impossible. We're relying on other family members to tell us information at this point, which is pretty sad. Now health authorities and long-term care homes are bracing for this new, more transmissible strain. But when it comes to vaccination, doctors expect the COVID-19 vaccines will still be effective. We manage this with flu every year. The, the vaccine manufacturers have indicated that they'll simply adjust their, the production of their vaccine to take into account new strains. Ontario health officials say large volumes of positive samples are now being screened to investigate how prevalent the variant is here. We'll probably have a much better understanding of other variants, including this variant globally, as genomic tests scale up worldwide. With holiday gatherings, the worry is it could be silently spreading. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Let's bring in Dr. Susie Hoda, an infectious disease specialist in Toronto. Hi, Dr. Hoda. Good to have you with us. Now that we know all reported cases here in Canada are people who acquired the new strain from travel to the UK or had contacts who did, does that change anything? Well, to some degree, it's a little bit reassuring because it suggests that this variant has not been sort of introduced within the communities in Canada and spreading amongst people who haven't had a clear link to high risk. Uh, individuals or people who've been in areas where it's common. However, when it comes down to what we need to do, I don't think it really changes a whole lot. First of all, it reinforces uh, the message that we need to have really good global surveillance so that when these kinds of mutations are, are detected elsewhere, it's communicated across the world and, and we're prepared for that. But second of all, it you know also reminds us how important it is to avoid travel unless it's absolutely essential, even now, Speaking of places outside of Canada, as you mentioned, do you think this new strain of the virus, Doctor, has contributed to the speed of its spreading in countries where lockdowns don't appear to be as effective as they were in the first wave at, at containing the virus? 
I'm not really sure that we can say that it explains why lockdowns have not necessarily worked so well in some areas, partly because that epidemiology doesn't quite match, you know, in terms of where we know this uh, variant is and what the experience has been. I think when it comes down to lockdowns, it's likely reflective of how stringently these are being imposed, whether or not they actually end up being successful. Okay, thanks, doctor. And Dr. Hoda will be back in a couple of minutes with us. As for Ontario's overall COVID-19 situation tonight, case numbers are still up there, but not as high as they have been. Ontario saw more than 400 fewer new cases than Christmas Eve's record-setting high. Today's count, 2,005, with the same number of recoveries. 18 people, however, in the province passed away due to COVID-19. As for Alberta and BC, we don't have hard figures for the past few days, but the trend lines suggest both are recording fewer daily cases than early December. Even so, some long-term care homes in BC have been locked down so tightly, family visits are severely limited. Stephanie Mercier looks at the outbreak of loneliness and depression that's causing. For residents of long-term care homes in BC, good news is on the horizon. Vaccinations are now happening, the first on Christmas Eve. I'm very happy. The rest can't come soon enough. I received a phone call that she will be getting the vaccine in the next two weeks. Kath Ann Ambrose's mother Evelyn has been in a care home in North Vancouver since the end of February. She is able to visit her, but she's the only one allowed to go once a week for 30 minutes. And they can't touch. She's a very normally a very up, very positive, um, a woman of strong faith. I have noticed her mood um, dipping, definitely. Restrictions on long-term care visitors in this province are among the toughest in the country. Last month, BC's Seniors Advocate released results of a study looking at the experiences of more than 13,000 British Columbians. She found residents are more concerned about being separated from family than about COVID. I think in this case, the science actually would say that the current visitor restrictions are overly restrictive. They're now causing unnecessary suffering, unnecessary deaths. The National Institute on Aging says BC is not striking the right balance. Ontario has allowed more visitors by increasing testing, but that hasn't happened here. It is a shame because I think families have been separated for a very long time, and I think in in many cases, we could have shortened that time or, or increased visitation with proper screening, uh, with rapid testing. If you say, do you want to live a few more months or would you rather actually spend a few hours with your family members? I can tell you my patients and these residents would probably all say the same thing. Let me see my loved ones. Let me hold them. Let me touch them. But with no change to the restrictions in sight, families are left clinging to the hope the vaccine will finally bring them closer. Stephanie Mercier, CBC News, Vancouver. Quebec released new COVID numbers today, the province's first update since Christmas Eve. So the total covers three days. That number is 6,783 new cases. Hospitalizations and admissions to intensive care also ticked up. Quebec is now into the third day of a tough new lockdown. On Christmas, all non-essential business and schools were ordered to close their doors until January 11th. Valeria Cory Minocchio tells us how it's going so far. It's been a rocky start to the new lockdown. 11 people received fines of more than $1,500 for gathering illegally Saturday night at this Boston pizza near Quebec City. The owners of the restaurant say four employees invited seven other people to have a party. Co-owner Mathieu Castillou says the employees will not work in the coming days to ensure public health measures are followed. There will also be disciplinary action. Not long after, Quebec City police were called to this church. More than 40 people were inside. Only 25 are permitted in places of worship in the province's red zones. Présentement, toutes les personnes vont être identifiées. Sandra Dion with Quebec City Police says people will be identified, an investigation is underway and there could be fines. Other lockdown measures in effect, only stores selling essential goods are open. And that's all they're allowed to sell. It came as a surprise to some shoppers at this Canadian Tire. They've sectioned off everything, it's quite frustrating. I had to call before to find out if I could even buy this. We just came to get a cutting board. And, uh, and then we walked in and realized that 
everything was uh, sealed off so you couldn't get into that area. Hardware stores are also open, but they can only sell certain products for repairs, exterior maintenance or construction. The population that is entering in the hardware store still think that they can solve problems and conducting some nice uh, decoration or renovation project. But the government wants to level the playing field. During the first lockdown back in March, many small businesses closed their doors as big box stores stayed open. This is a kind of policy is better than uh, the policy that was put in place before. Public health officials hope Quebecers adapt to these new restrictions. They'll be in place until January 11th. Valeria Corey Minocchio, CBC News, Montreal. Alberta has taken a different approach. While much of the province is locked down, retail stores are still open. According to current guidelines, they're limited, though, to 15% capacity. This was the scene yesterday outside a mall near Calgary, a long lineup of eager shoppers waiting for Boxing Day sales. This is my 11-year-old daughter who needs to spend her Christmas money on Boxing Day. It's crazy. I mean, I, everyone's, everyone's got the same idea, and it got to go do some shopping and stuff, but... Yeah, it's crazy. Numbers weren't provided, but this mall has capacity for 6,200 people. That means only about 900 people are allowed inside at any one time. Vaccinations are seen as the best weapon in the war on COVID-19. Ontario is facing criticism tonight for halting parts of its vaccine rollout over the holiday. Carolyn Dunn looks at that and also shows us how Canada's vaccine rollout compares to other countries. In Quebec, vaccinations continued right through the holiday. Thousands got the jab over Christmas. By contrast, Ontario stopped vaccinations altogether for Christmas Day and Boxing Day. Today, just five hospital clinics opened. Tomorrow, five more. The pause was necessary, a spokesperson says, to ensure there was no impact on staffing levels at long-term care homes and hospitals. But critics say every day counts. I don't think that this virus takes weekends or holidays off and I know how dedicated the healthcare workers are in this province that they would be there to vaccinate at all hours so let's make it happen. Alberta is vaccinating every day except Christmas and New Year's Day. Oxford University tracked global data and found Canada's vaccination rate falls short of others. By Christmas Eve in Canada, just 0.12 people per 100 had received a vaccine. Russia, the U.S. and the U.K. far outpaced that. And Israel and Bahrain are global leaders, having vaccinated more than three people in every hundred. Today, 27 nations in the European Union joined the race to vaccinate. A 20-year-old German pilot flew his plane in the shape of a syringe to celebrate. The vaccines are rolling out now and uh, maybe an inspiration for people to think about it. This 101-year-old in Berlin didn't have to think long. She joined people from Portugal to Poland, getting first jabs aimed at long-term care home residents and their health care workers. Greece's Prime Minister declared the procedure painless. The EU has set an ambitious goal of vaccinating 450 million people. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. The head of British drug company AstraZeneca said today its vaccine will be effective against the new UK variant. The UK is expected to approve the vaccine sometime this week. Partial testing had indicated AstraZeneca's treatment is less effective than the Pfizer vaccine. But today, the British drug maker said it has found a, quote, winning formula that matches its rivals. Canada's far north is set to get its first vaccine doses on Monday, days after they arrived in Canada. Territories are set to receive the Moderna vaccine, which doesn't require the same deep freeze as the Pfizer vaccine, the one first approved here in Canada. Territorial leaders say vaccinations will roll out in early January. Dr. Hoda joins us again. Doctor, we know that some clinics in Ontario are pausing vaccinations for the holidays. Is that a concern? Well, I think we all feel just the urgency of trying to get vaccine out, especially with what we're seeing with numbers and with the new variant in the UK that's come out that seems to be transmitting. 
completely. Um, but whether a few days pause is actually going to make a huge difference, I'm not really sure. There are a lot of other factors to take into consideration, including um, just that cadence of when we receive vaccine and trying to match that with, with the clinics. Also, um, you know, over the holidays, if people don't show up for their there's always that risk of wastage. And so you have to balance all these things together in order to have the best kind of strategy for vaccination over this period. Let's talk about the two-dose requirement for both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, doctor. Some provinces like BC and New Brunswick, for example, they plan to vaccinate as many people as they can without holding back second doses. Over in Ontario, they're saving part of their initial vaccine shipments for the second dose. Which approach makes the most sense from your perspective? Well, it seems to me that it would make sense to try and get as much vaccine out to people as possible, even if it's that first dose and trying to get a wide coverage. Because from what we've seen from the clinical trials, about 50% of people are protected first dose. And then that goes up to the about 95% after um, having received the second dose. So even at the 50%, on a population level, that would actually have potentially a, a good impact. Um, so, you know, I, I'm hoping this will be reevaluated over time as the supply of vaccine becomes more stable. And there's less fear of people having interchanged the types of vaccines that they're getting because of supply issues. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hoda. Dr. Susie Hoda is an infectious disease specialist with us from Toronto. In the U.S., Dr. Anthony Fauci isn't optimistic about COVID cases at the beginning of the new year. We very well might see a post-seasonal, in the sense of Christmas, uh, New Year's surge. And as I've described it as a surge upon a surge. December has been the deadliest month for the pandemic south of the border, with more than 63,000 deaths. It's also left millions of Americans out of work, running out of money and worried about being evicted. For many of those struggling Americans, likely a sense of relief tonight. A standoff between President Trump and U.S. lawmakers has ended with word he has finally signed a U.S. COVID relief and government funding bill. Katie Nicholson joins us from Washington. Katie, the standoff started when the president demanded stimulus payments be hiked from $600 to $2,000. Do we know if he got his way? Well, Vashu, the short answer is it's not entirely clear yet. The moment the president made this demand, Democrats said they'd be only too happy to increase the payments to $2,000. The demand has few Republican supporters, though, and, and Republicans run the Senate. That's crucial. This increase is being put to a vote in the House tomorrow, where it's likely going to pass. But, you know, the statement from the White House tonight merely says the Senate will start the voting process on the $2,000 amount. Well, that was going to happen anyway. It's it's still not clear if that means the president has brokered a deal with Senate Republicans to ensure that it passes. Although Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, he's tweeted a statement applauding the president for signing with the caveat that the compromise bill isn't perfect. He also doesn't explicitly say anything about the $2,000 amount that the president wanted. So clearly some of the details here are still falling into place. So then what does happen now? Okay, well, let's start with the personal relief checks. Obviously, an amount has to be approved first. The government had originally thought it could get those direct deposits moving into people's accounts by the end of this week. Well, it's unknown now at this point how the delay in signing this bill is going to affect that rollout. And yesterday, unemployment benefits ran out for more than 10 million Americans. Now, the TAFs will be turned back on. More unemployment money will start flowing into the new year. And a COVID eviction moratorium kept, uh, it's keeping millions of Americans in their home right now. It was set to expire on New Year's Eve. Now, with the signing of this bill, that has been extended for another month until the new administration is sworn in. And crucially, this averted a partial government shutdown, which would have kicked in on Tuesday. And, you know, it would have been the second one of, of Trump's time in office, the first time being the 35-day one around the border wall funding issue. So while the president signed the bill a little late, it is better than never and certainly appears to be good news tonight for the American people. All right, thanks, Katie. Katie Nicholson for us in Washington. Over in Nashville, authorities in that city are calling the Christmas Day explosion there a suicide bombing, but stopping short of saying it was domestic terrorism. When we assess an event for uh, domestic terrorism nexus, it has to be tied to an ideology. It's the uh, use of force or violence in the uh, furtherance of a political social ideology or, or event. We haven't tied to that yet. Officials don't know why it happened, but they believe they know who did it. Anthony Warner, his DNA was found on pieces of the exploded RV. 
And the first officers to respond are being called heroes tonight for making sure people got out of the way. I just see orange and then I hear a loud boom. And uh, as I'm stumbling, because uh, it, it rocked me that hard, I started stumbling. I just tell myself to stay on your feet, stay alive. And east of Nashville this afternoon, police were investigating this truck stopped on a country road. It was playing music like the RV did before it exploded. Officers sent a bomb robot out. While they didn't find any explosives, the driver was taken into custody. A town in northern Ontario is turning to its name for a better future. The name Cobalt is infectious and the Cobalt camp is sort of being reborn again. Up next, why the demand for cobalt is on the rise. Plus, lessons from a global pandemic. 2020, unbelievable. It was a year of incredible chaos. 2020, the year that taught us all we can't take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. Our reporters look back on the story that changed all of our lives. And later, a 2020 mystery with a holiday twist. I mean, you can smell it, so I think you know, you know it's real. So how did the cookie crumble? Find out a bit later. We'll be right back. A northern Ontario town is hoping electric vehicles can jumpstart its economy. Cobalt was named after the metal, now widely used for electric car batteries. And demand is expected to surge in 2025 when Ford and other automakers start producing electric vehicles in Canada. Philippe de Montigny brings us this look. At the popular Silver Café, retired miners gather almost every morning for a cup of coffee. André Brunet is baffled by the new hype around cobalt, the rare metal their small town in northern Ontario was named after. When we mine cobalt, we never did look for cobalt. They're always looking for silver. Cobalt was merely a byproduct of silver mining back then. Not worth that much. But it's now used in smartphones and electric car batteries. Castle mine, it's 100 years old. Matthew Halliday is going back into an old mine, looking for that increasingly valuable metal. This pink here. So that's the cobalt bloom. Cobalt holds an electric charge and doesn't overheat. The president of Canada Silver Cobalt Works says it's now the town's best hope for its future. Especially with big companies like Ford and Fiat Chrysler gearing up to build electric cars and their batteries in Canada by 2025. Cobalt production doesn't just turn on a dime. It can take years to ramp up. But the big players here hope to eventually supply Ontario's auto sector. I think that we need to have um, secure sources of cobalt here in, in Canada and in North America. With demand and price rising, many companies are rushing to find viable sites to develop in the cobalt region. Toronto-based First Cobalt is investing $80 million to get to production. It plans to refurbish an old cobalt refinery to quadruple its output. But this mining business professor warns cobalt might not be in huge demand forever. Companies like Panasonic and Tesla are planning to build uh, batteries that would eliminate cobalt completely. He says they're looking to replace the costly metal with cheaper alternatives. Thank you. Still, back at the local restaurant, there's hope for better days ahead. The name cobalt is infectious and the cobalt camp is sort of being reborn again. A rebirth for their small town of jobs and prosperity. Philippe de Montigny, CBC News, Cobalt, Ontario. Now we're going even further north to talk about someone mining value out of the leftovers of a mine. So far, Diane Hache has raised nearly $100,000 for a Yellowknife women's shelter. Mark Winkler shows us how. That's the reward. Diane Hache is stripping insulation off copper wire for a good cause. That's my goal. To learn how to do that, that's the, well, that was a, quite a challenge and everybody thought it was crazy, I gotta admit. Hache says this work is tough on the body and that on occasion it's driven her to tears by the end of the day. But she keeps coming back to do it here in this tent she set up to do the job. In 2019, Diavik Diamond Mine, her former employer, gave her three shipping containers filled with used copper wire. Also, she could sell it and donate the money to charity. She could have done it the easy way, just selling it as is, but removing the plastic insulation that surrounds the copper more than doubles its value. 
Hache spent all last winter here in this shelter with a propane heater working alone. They said, Diane, that's impossible to do, but impossible is just an opinion until you try. She ended up selling 38,000 pounds of copper in Vancouver this past spring, the weight of about six pickup trucks. This fall, she presented a $94,000 check to the Yellowknife Women's Society. So I wanted to, them to have the rooms that they came in more homey. They need to pick up their strength that their tomorrow, there's a better tomorrow. Hache says she wanted to help women because of the important role they play in families. Women are the backbone of the family and they need support. And with the pandemic, more so because all around Canada, all, all across Canada, there, there's shortage of shelters for the women because there's a lot of violence. Hache says her work didn't end there. She'll have more copper to send to Vancouver soon. I'll probably have close to 50,000 pounds and the price is really up. I'm hoping for a, for a, a bonanza. <laughs> and thanks to her hard work, another big donation will follow to this city's women's shelter. Mark Winkler, CBC News, Yellowknife. When we come back, the challenges of covering a global pandemic. At this time last year, we had absolutely no idea how much the entire world as we knew it was about to change. Our reporters look back on some key moments of a year we will never forget. Welcome back. For healthcare workers, public officials, and everyday Canadians, the past year has been a strange and sometimes scary odyssey, full of uncertainty and unwanted surprises. And while we can soon finally and fortunately close the door on 2020, COVID-19 is not going anywhere for a while. So tonight, we're taking a look back at how it all started in our reporter's notebook. Twenty twenty. Unbelievable. It was a year of incredible chaos. Twenty twenty. The year that taught us all we can't take anything for granted. At this time last year, we had absolutely no idea how much the entire world as we knew it was about to change. I started to hear about this mysterious viral pneumonia in China around New Year's Eve. The first story that I filed for The National was on January 16th, and at that point, we knew that there were 41 people or so that were ill in China. Two people had died. I remember talking to doctors and, and asking them, you know, should we be worried? And, you know, they weren't really sure at the time. It's really too early to be confident about what the disease looks like. It's extremely important that uh, we be wary of infections that might be acquired on uh, distant lands that might land on our doorstep. Health Canada says hospitals are on alert and that anyone arriving from an affected country who is experiencing flu-like symptoms should notify authorities immediately. <laughs> In the third week of January is when we started to see the lockdowns in China, first in Wuhan and then in Hubei. And I was sitting at my desk and I did a quick search of the population of Hubei and it was nearly 60 million people. And I remember thinking, this is gonna be big, 60 million. Whoa, that's more than the population of Canada. Could we be heading in that direction? And, and sure enough, it was only a few days later that the first case actually did land in Canada. Thank you, Minister, and good morning, everyone. I want to impress upon everyone that although we now have a case in Canada, the risk to Canadians remains low. I remember that day, and I think what was stunning about it is how quickly that changed and how quickly we went from uh, the risk remains low to most of us to suddenly shut down, stay home, stay safe, and we had no real idea of how it was going to impact our lives. There are now more than 118,000 cases in 114 countries. March 11th, the WHO declares a global pandemic. Those 
hundreds of cases that we saw in China now turned into more than 100,000 cases. More than 100 countries were affected. And that's when it really set in that this was not something that could be contained. I remember after that is when we, it really settled in, cemented for us, that we need to get out there and start showing Canadians some of the things that are changing. At the time, I was taking the GO train here in Toronto every day. Union Station was packed, as I'd imagine, all other transit hubs across the country. And we were hearing about social distancing. Putting at least a meter between yourself and someone who might be sick isn't always easy. This is roughly the distance that's being recommended. So if you're near someone, is this comfortable? Considering the situation, yes. For others, it seems unrealistic. Honestly, like in crowded areas, probably not. Keeping people apart will be socially disruptive and economically damaging, but scientists insist it will also save lives. It seemed like day after day we were going out trying to test some of these um, new measures that were coming into place. How does it work? And a Toronto hospital offered us this opportunity to come into a training facility where they were training nurses to do these nasal swab tests. And at first they were going to do it on a volunteer and then somehow I became the volunteer. <laughs> Hi, Christine. Hi. Hi, my name is Cherry. I'm one of the nurses here. You can please follow me. After a quick check, the ER doctor makes the call. A nasal swab goes down the throat or up through the nose. So if you can pull down your mask. Okay. Am my swab? Never had this done before. Okay. Yes, it's startling, but it's over in a moment. That's it. It's all done. The results take 24 hours, but doctors urge people not to just show up in hospital. Did I feel like a guinea pig? A little bit, um, but I'm always up for it. I feel like if we're gonna show people something that's necessary and important, then I should be willing to do it too. Um, I, I think our goal is always to try and take people inside and explain how things work. But that time when we were watching the numbers and, and seeing the effect on Canadians, it felt like a bit of a carousel where we were just going around and around, numbers were going up, restrictions would go down. It just felt like this constant um, dizzying pace. We were reporting on potential treatments that we would never have reported on in the past. Usually in science, you wait till clinical trials are done and, and there are, are meta-analyses and then you can talk about something that you know, could be a game changer. But now we're doing stories about game changers almost every other week about potential new treatments. Hydroxychloroquine was something that all countries were looking at, but then it became quickly discredited. There were steroids, there was remdesivir. The science was so quickly evolving, it was making our heads spin. The idea that this could spread so quickly in long-term care homes, knowing what we did about the, the SARS virus, what other countries were saying about protect your long-term care homes. The fact that it still happened was a real shock to people. It was a shock to journalists that, you know, we, we saw these warning signs, but um, just not enough was done to protect this population. As I've said many times, we need to do a better job of caring for the people who built this country. The greatest generation saw us through World War II, and we need to be there to support them properly. He was a good person. He didn't deserve to die like that. Nobody deserves to die like that. Such a beautiful person. This loss is all the more haunting because of what else is missing. I love you. Peace. There's no peace with this ending. You put your loved one in a home counting on them to take care of your loved one. It's just terrible. It's inhuman. Bob Toms, his family says, was a gentle soul, a retired building engineer who battled cancer and then dementia. He was our older brother. He was amazing. He made everybody feel special. Now he's one of the faces of a decimated generation. Susan Hines and Bill Toms are convinced their brother never had a fighting chance. It's why they're fighting for him now. He died without dignity. He died without care. He died without his family. Amen. That breaks my heart. 
In many ways, this was a preventable tragedy. The people who died in long-term care homes, you know, many of them were infected and ultimately died because of lack of PPE or lack of infection control or just lack of clear policy. And in that confusion, you know, we heard from families calling the homes where their parents were in and not being able to get through. Others who hadn't seen them for months until they were finally allowed window visits and seeing their loved ones decimated. We saw somebody that I didn't recognize in a hospital bed. How did he look? Skin on bone. There was nothing there. Just um, mouth agape, uh, wanting to communicate, but maybe not having the strength to. Like, want, he's, he's moving and making gestures, but I don't think he had any strength to do anything. They took these disturbing photos and say when they called out through the window for help, a staff member told them their brother had been turning down food and water. I said, I want to see him not be able to drink. And they went and got him a glass of water and he drank a glass and a half of water. It was a revealing glimpse into a home in crisis. To date, the vast majority of the 159 residents at Guildwood have been infected and nearly 50 residents have died from the virus. Michelle Wilson's father was one of them. Her grief is overwhelming. So is her outrage. If this had happened in a school and it was children dying, there would have been an uproar. How do we allow this? How do we have so little regard and respect for our seniors? Well, this pandemic showed how unevenly the virus affected people. It also exposed the vulnerabilities in our society. We did stories about uh, people who are drug dependent, drug users, who barely got by on the streets and they were suddenly left alone on the streets. Writing poetry, a diversion from three months of pandemic upheaval. Except for the safe injection sites, I didn't know really anywhere else to go um, to stay warm or to be safe. When the pandemic hit, she was sleeping here. Her struggle with heroin then went from bad to worse. We've agreed to protect her identity. I OD'd three times and um, woke up, you know, alone because I was using alone. It really struck me how vulnerable these populations were. And, it, and the virus really did affect different communities in different ways. There are people on the edge in our society who got pushed over that edge when this pandemic hit. There were these unintended consequences, these casualties of uh, the coronavirus that we weren't seeing in those daily statistics. We were introduced to a, a family who lost a member of their family. Uh, he had to have this procedure to prepare him for kidney dialysis. That procedure was canceled. He later died from that. And these sorts of stories were starting to emerge. And it became clear that there was going to be a wider consequences of this shutdown. It taught me that there are other factors at play that really affect your health and your health outcomes. And it really exposed the extreme differences in our health consequences. I think of people, though, who've lost loved ones and who've lost jobs and who's whose worlds have turned upside down. And, you know, I think to me, the biggest lesson of 2020 is learning to be grateful even more and becoming comfortable with the discomfort that uncertainty has brought. This year has been crazy, but the pandemic is not over. And I hope that next year, we're sitting here looking back on the pandemic, but there is such a long way still to go. The next thing that I'm really going to be paying attention to is the vaccine rollout. I've heard scientists talk about this, that all of this is like trying to launch a space shuttle. It's that complex. I know people have lots of questions and we're just gonna keep trying to answer them. And if that means I need to now get a shot on TV, then I'll go get my shots on TV too. 2020 was also a year of upheaval and protest in tomorrow's Reporter's Notebook. The impact of the Black Lives Matter movement and how one man's tragic death set so much of it in motion. So what's happening is just down that street. They're coming this way. We're going to have to go around this way. So what's happening, Ian? Police are trying to clear the area. There we go right there. 
During those demonstrations in DC, I saw stuff I've never seen before. I saw people, you know, breaking into office buildings and setting the lobbies on fire. People were hurt. Uh, stores were looted. Things were set on fire. People were trying to make the point that nothing ever changes. If it doesn't take the death of George Floyd, then what does it take? Still ahead, finding new ways to reduce food waste. The only limit for sped grain like that, it's our imagination. Why one Montreal initiative is turning beer into bread. We'll be right back. Expect to pay more for groceries next year by as much as $700. That's according to the latest Canada Food Price Report, and that can be tough to reconcile when you consider how much is wasted. Half of all food in Canada, in fact, is wasted. That's more than a $5 billion loss every year. Yet one in seven Canadians suffer from food insecurity. The federal government says reducing food waste is a priority, even offering cash prizes for the most innovative ideas. Alison Northcott now on a Montreal co-op with a project and an idea to bite on. The barley here. This is where beer begins, and the wheat and barley malt used to brew it. The grain is in the mill, right through the over. Eventually becomes this. It's the main byproduct of beer brewing. That's the grain that defines a bit the taste also of the beer. Basile Tis is part of a co-op called Boomerang that turns those leftovers into bread. We collect spring grain from the breweries and we directly dry it at the brewery and then we bring it to a bakery to mill it into flour. I'm pouring the wet grain into the dryer. The goal is to reduce food waste. In Canada, about half of the food supply is wasted each year. Initiatives like this where you have people finding creative ways to use their talents and to use waste in new ways, uh, that it is uh, really exciting. It's just one small project, but Alice Irene Whitaker says it shows what could be done on a larger scale through what's called the circular economy. The movement towards a circular economy is very much rooted in solving environmental challenges, but it also is very economic in nature. But she says for that to catch on in a big way, new policies and systemic changes are needed across several industries. Reducing food waste is part of the Canadian government's first ever food policy released in 2019. The team at Boomerang want their initiative to grow, to include more breweries and bakeries like this one. We try to do our part try to make a wave that can uh, grow bigger, you know, in the future. The brewery involved says most of its spent grain goes to farmers for animal feed, but it sees the potential for something more. The only limit for f spent grain like that, it's our imagination. And your customers like it? They love it. And he hopes others will too and keep this cycle going. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Regina has a cool idea to help deal with food insecurity in that city, and we do mean cool. It set up a community fridge with free food for the taking. Every morning that we come to visit the food and check on it and um, clean up the fridge, the, it's all empty, all the food is gone. The fridge usually contains everything from fresh fruits to frozen meals. Organizers hope it will build a sense of community for the area and that local businesses will help keep it stocked. After the break, a Christmas treat, no more. I think the raccoons came up and got it. Like they thought it was a Christmas present for them, right? The story behind the latest monolith is coming up next. In late November, a giant metal monolith was discovered in Utah. Since then, monoliths have been popping up all over the United States, a few in California, another in Pittsburgh, one even popped up on Britain's Isle of Wight. But the latest to appear was in San Francisco on Christmas Day. It was a bit different than the others, made of a very festive material that didn't last very long. This is our moment. It's the silver lining of Christmas morning to wake up and smell some gingerbread atop a mountain peak. <laughs> I mean, you can smell it, so I think you know you know it's real. Yeah. I mean, Santa's real, right? Everything's real on Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but the mysterious and presumably delicious monolith didn't last long. By the next day, it had crumbled. 
leaving witnesses to wonder what happened. I think the raccoons came up and got it. Like they thought it was a Christmas present for them, right? They definitely came and ate it. It's hard to say what exactly happened, but um, looks like I didn't make it in time to enjoy this. Maybe some critters here did, or some hungry residents, but it's uh, definitely no longer standing. The monolith was apparently about seven feet tall, and apparently also people ate it. It was made of real gingerbread. They tried it, real icing, real gumdrop. That's that, and that is The National for December 27th. I'm Vashi Capellos. Have a great night.